questions about the second impeachment. So a lot of people are saying, well, let's just get to the base of the bottom line about this. Trump was impeached as president. So there's no real issue that you're impeaching a citizen. He's been impeached. The only question now is, can he be convicted? The argument for why it's an unconstitutional impeachment is because of the conjunction and not the disjunction in the sanction, which is removed from office and, sorry, what, what, what's, what is it now? It's convicted and removed from office? Uh, disqualified. Uh, the Essentially, well, part one is that the whole purpose and role and policy behind impeachment was what do you do when the person that's violating the law is the person in charge with enforcing it? And so the solution was, OK, you, you don't want the judicial system being able to uh, br uh, sort of breach the separation of powers by the civil and criminal justice system being used against them while they're in office. So what's the alternative, though? The alternative then was, OK, impeach, remove them from that office if they're violating the law so that the fact that they're the ones that are supposed to be enforcing it is removed as a problem. And then they can subsequently, once they've been removed from office, be civilly punished and civilly prosecuted by the civil justice system. So that's the policy behind impeachment, broadly discussed during the convention, during the uh, constitutional debates about it and, and so forth, and show up recurrently in all of the uh, impeachments, including the first impeachment of Justice Samuel Chase in 1805, uh, and including, in fact, as was cited in, the, in Trump's uh, response, brief, uh, brief on the merits filed today in the Congress, was that the very first law professor to the very first cabinet to the very first Congress, who was one of the founding fathers, pointed out this limit on impeachment, that that's its only role. Its role is to deal with one particular problem. What happens when the law violator is the law enforcer? Well, you solve that problem by removing them from the position of law enforcement. That's why from that policy perspective, the idea that someone who's not in office could be impeached makes no sense at all. And that's why historically, that's how most people have approached it. Legal scholars, senators, others. They have the only exception to that was whether or not a cabinet official could be tried in the Senate when he resigned right on the verge of the trial vote taking place. And in that unique context, there had always been a question about whether resignation sa saved you or not. And a majority of senators said resignation was not sufficient to revoke jurisdiction. But the legally binding vote was the verdict vote. And there, uh, the court the court of the Senate, that's what they become when an impeachment case, came back and said, no, we don't have jurisdiction to do, uh, adjudicate an impeachment trial or to punish an individual as a private citizen when they no longer hold public office, given the point and purpose of it. The, uh, in the 1970s, 1974, when Nixon resigned, uh, both the House committee and the Office of the Department of Justice of Office of Legal Counsel both concluded that you could not continue with an impeachment of someone who's no longer president. Various articles and law review articles in the 90s and 2000s came to the same conclusion. Almost nobody has advocated the position since way back in the 1870s when a few senators who were mad at the existing cabinet guy have argued that you have the power to impeach ex-officials. And the, the language well, of the Constitution but, says the president. It doesn't say a president. It doesn't say ex a president. It says the president. Uh, no better example of that than in their, in their own memorandum. The Democrats are admitting that the president is used twice, once in the impeachment clause, also as to who presides over the trial. And they said, well, when it comes to presiding over the trial, the president uh, means the president. But when it comes to impeachment, the president means a president. And that's why we can have someone be a juror. and a ju That's why the chief justice is not presiding. You know, the Constitution requires that it, in any impeachment of the president, it, it requires the chief justice preside over the trial. So the, uh, in fact, it wouldn't surprise me if Roberts has created a backup plan to invalidate this down the road if he ever had to on the grounds that he didn't preside. Uh, because Chief Justice Rehnquist made this argument many years ago that there are three things the Senate cannot violate in an impeachment context. Uh, one of them is how the impeachment comes through. Second is the two-thirds vote requirement. And third is that if it's the president or vice president, the chief justice must preside. Uh, and that that would be a, ju a justiciable question. So the uh, so it's one of the many 
uh, problems. But problem one is impeachment's whole point and purpose and policy was for only to apply to existing officials. That's the it's there to resolve a particular problem, which is which, a problem that cannot constitutionally exist if there's not a, an official there. Second, the specific language is that the impeachment power shall go no further than the uh, removal and disqualification. It uses the conjunctive and. It refers to the president, not a president. It refers to existing civil officers, no, no, not ex-officers. Third, state constitutions and the British Parliament had previously allowed for uh, it had explicit express language at the time of our Constitution. The Vermont Constitution, other state constitutions also provided for uh, actually impeaching ex-officials. We chose not to do so. And this was known and historically under constitutional standards. That means that power was deliberately stripped from Congress, not empowered by sub uh, silencio, as the language could be. So uh, that's part three. Part four is the bill of attainder. The, the okay, whole so point is the legislature cannot punish or prosecute a private citizen. Okay, wait, so before we get to the bill of attainder, one question that I had. Now, it had to do with impeaching. Oh, the Belknap, the Belknap precedent. So one question is that he's been impeached as president. So that, you know, you can't impeach an ex-president. Well, he's been impeached. The question is, can you convict an ex-president? In the Belknap case, I don't remember the details. I know it was um, bribery and taking money, you know, yeah. taking money for bribes. Uh, I don't know exactly what position Belknap was, and it's B-E-L- Secretary of Defense. Say it again? Secretary of Defense. Secretary of Defense. So he was he was impeached on having taken well, bribes. That might have been called Secretary of War back then. Secretary of War is right. That's for sure. So he was impeached, resigned, and then there was going to be a trial held for you know after his resignation. And the arguments were raised that you can't have a trial, uh, you can't have an impeachment trial once there has been a resignation following the impeachment. But my understanding is that that argument lost in that more senators voted that we had jurisdiction. Then voted that we didn't have jurisdiction for that reason, and they had the, they held the trial. They didn't get the votes primarily because of the substantial amount of senators who said we never had jurisdiction in the first place. Right. Does that not create the precedent for the legitimacy, or at the very least, the possibility of conducting a trial of someone who has either since resigned or no longer holds office for an impeachment that occurred when they did hold office? In my view, the legally uh, precedential vote would be the verdict vote not the preliminary vote, because the, you know, any vote for impeachment has to be, uh, if her conviction has to be two thirds. And so any preliminary vote is like a vote on evidence. It's a procedural vote. It's not anything of persuasive value. It's when they went to verdict, did, uh, did they get more than two thirds to say that, yes, they had jurisdiction. And then again, it would be persuasive precedent, but not much else. Um, because I mean, it, it's the Senate, so it's not like they're not bound by their prior Senate actions. Uh, it doesn't really mean much. It's, it's really what the, so it's not like a court in that sense. It's a court, but it's not a court that's bound by precedent, even frankly considers it much. Um, but in my view, the only precedential vote to the degree there is one that comes out of it is that a, not a two thirds of the senators, uh, did not agree that they had jurisdiction over an ex official. And so I think that's a problem. The additional problem is, of course, this is the president. They've, they've never tried this in the context of the president uh, so uh, before. Uh, and so it's all of that. And the plain text and point and purpose and policy of it and the other component, which was not actually raised in Belknap, was whether or not this was a bill, a bill of attainder. Clearly, quite frankly, it is. It's okay, legislative yeah. punishment of an individual who's a private citizen. That's all that's required. doesn't How, matter what so his prior status was. Uh, now, so Bill of Attainder, I, I mean, I looked into it very summarily, but I have understood it to be a, a, a piece of legislation that was passed that targets an individual or an identifiable group. But it doesn't require it be legislation. It's any action by the legislature that punishes an individual. That's it. And the whole point is that there could be no legislative punishment of individuals. That has to be done by the judicial branch and it has to be under the judicial and jury trial rights. And the and so th that's why this clearly fits it. And uh, one last component on the impeachment side, the only real precedent is out of two state courts, Missouri and Florida, which have adjudicated almost identical language about whether you can impeach an ex official. And both states concluded about 100 years apart that you cannot. 
And so the only courts to have ever addressed this, only the real precedent to specifically address this, have rejected the idea that you can impeach an ex-official. Uh, that's part one. Part two, the Bill of Attainers, just the legislative branch cannot be in the business of personally punish, of pers of punishing individuals, period. And the that was the whole end. That was a big difference between us and uh, the U and our Brit and the British uh, precedents of the past. And so that's another reason why this can't be done. This, I have yet to see a good argument as to how this is not a bill of attainder. The uh, uh, the only argument is that somehow impeachment is an exception to the bill of attainder and fits within it. But again, impeachment was a, was not about punishing an individual. It was about removal of a person from office and and then barring them from immediately returning to that office as a subsequent. It's not about uh, uh, punishing an individual after the fact when they no longer held office. So the the second prob problem, of course, is that if it violates the First Amendment, violates the amendment, they don't have evidence. It's multiplicitous. Okay, wait. Uh, Stop that one second, uh, Robert. You're you're glitching, and maybe it's maybe the stream is going to come back in. Okay, it looks a little better. Actually, before we get into the First and Fifth Amendment discussion, uh, Thorne Blackwell, and it was a question someone asked earlier: How can Trump be convicted by a different group of people than those who impeachment? Then, sorry, than those who impeached him? The swapping in and out of those elected changed the jury. Well, it's it's two problems. One is that uh, technically Pelosi failed to deliver the impeachment until after Trump was out. And she did that because she wanted a different Senate majority leader in charge. And so that creates a constitutional issue. The uh, next constitutional issue is uh, the is Leahy being both judge and jury. Juror. Uh, that's a problem. Three, the chief justice not being present in the case. Fourth, the fact that histor historically they have recognized the due process clause does apply to the way they're supposed to do it. And they have internal rules about how impeachment is supposed to work. And, and that included giving him a chance to be heard, giving him advance notice, producing witnesses on his behalf. All of that was denied by the House. We have never had an impeachment where this has happened before to this degree. And, and that's what happened here. They just rushed it through. Um, so all of those, and then you have problems. Uh, I mean, one of the, it's the whole idea. You could have had a different jury from a person if this was a midterm issue. That part by itself wasn't necessarily a, a problem. It's, the problem is that it was a, uh, that she did not transfer the impeachment papers while Trump was president. Uh, and so that she deliberately delayed it to change who it is that got to adjudicate it. The impeachment trial starts tomorrow, right, Robert? Uh, part of it was supposed to start today, um, uh, but the uh, it, it's they they're still working out the details. So uh, I saw you know Rand Paul made some statements uh, saying, "Look, if we're going to redefine, because so you get past all of those issues, the due process issues, the no chief justice issues, a judge is also a juror issues, uh, the timing of when the transfer took place issues, whether you can." Uh, do this to someone who is no longer uh, holding office um, all and the bill of attainder issues. Even if you get past all those issues, you have two other big issues, uh, which is one, uh, the first amendment problem that this is protected speech. What is terrifying as Dershowitz has also recognized is that what they're, the precedent they're trying to set is not only the, is that there's no statute of limitations ever. That was part one. They claim. Part two, that there's no First Amendment application ever to any impeachment proceeding. And, uh, and related to there, too, no due process requirement ever. So they're saying the Constitution that gives them the power of impeachment does not apply. No other part of the Constitution applies to the actions of impeachment, which so, is an incredible, dangerous claim. Well, that is a discussion I've had with uh, other people. So some, you know, um, Jonathan Turley put out the article, said, the impeachment proceedings itself, uh, well, he said one gesture by Jamie Raskin, who invited Trump to testify during the trial. He says, if you don't testify, fine, but we will draw a very strong negative inference as to your guilt of these undeniable acts that you committed and you have the audacity to deny. So the, fir the first question is, I, I, I took that, especially seeing Turley, and I know and I respect Turley's opinion, that you, you have certain constitutional protections, even in the context of an impeachment, that you have the right to remain silent, you have the right to prevent self-incrimination, etc. There is a school of thought of people who say those 
constitutional protections don't apply to an impeachment because it's not a criminal trial. It's a political procedure. And, uh, you know, even in a civil trial, you don't have the right to remain silent. So, I mean, my, my reflex and my thinking is that, first of all, it, it's a quasi-criminal proceeding that you would have these rights to anyhow. So to, to threaten a, a negative inference from silence would itself be unconstitutional. But does the Constitution even apply to a process which many argue and many, you know, rightly note is a purely political procedure. So just because something is delegated to the political branches in the sense of the power that they have, it doesn't give them the right to do things. So there's this tendency to conflate. Somebody has the power to do something with that means they have the right to do it. The fact they have the power to do it does not mean they have the right to do so. Uh, if the Constitution, otherwise the Constitution means nothing. It just means, hey, if it involves this issue, you guys get to decide and ignore everything else that's in this document. Uh, clearly, that's not what the Constitution is. It, then it's no longer a constitutional government, frankly. Um, and so that's the problem with that argument. The other problem with the claim that the Constitution doesn't apply is that, one, it is quasi-criminal proceedings. Uh, the the plain language of the Constitution says it applies. It says this applies to state actors, period. We'll get into that in the uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene context a little bit later. Um, but the idea, if we're going to start setting a precedent that you, we can punish you for your, as a private citizen for your free speech, uh, without giving you any due process and hold it against you. If you assert the fifth amendment, deny you your right to the sixth amendment right to counsel, then our impeachment proceedings make even British parliamentary impeachment proceedings, which we hated at the time of the founding look like an ideal system. It makes our system look like a complete joke. I, I, and I, I, I really want to set set this precedent because it, 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 Republicans or whomever, maybe another party in the future, will drag up Hillary Clinton for disbarment, drag up Bill Clinton for disbarment, drag up Barack Obama for disbarment, drag up Joe Biden for disbarment, drag up Kamala Harris, even when she's an ex-official. I mean, you can keep going on and on and on and on. The, the, these show trials, this is Stalin-esque, Soviet-style show trials that they want to put on in the impeachment that violates every core constitutional constraint on constitutional on congressional activity in this precise sphere and space. And if they violate it, they make it is the Senate as an institution that will be indicting itself if it votes to allow these proceedings to continue. Well, I mean, if I was going to use the Stalinist, uh, uh, what's the word, analogy, I mean, it, it is it, it is nothing shy of a dictatorship that seeks not only to claim power, but then to crush any dissident. And through through objectively unconstitutional means by the argument that, well, the Constitution doesn't apply here. It, to me, it, it, it was over the top. And talking about, you know, Raskin's letter as, as if to compel testimony under the threat that if you don't testify so that we uh, under, you know, under our cross-examination, of course, um, that if you don't do it, we're going to hold it against you. So A, Salomo Baptist says, Salomo, Sal Salome Baptist Smith, please explain the notion of factual allegations in law. So Jamie Raskin in his letter says, you have denied our, our, our factual allegations in law, which we have clear evidence of, to, uh, to assert and which are clearly factual. So by virtue of having denied them, uh, you're denying a fact of this lawsuit and therefore you're compelled to testify as if the impeachment, the articles of impeachment are not allegations, but are foregone facts, foregone proven facts that now need to be disproven by the defendant under penalty of having your silence held against you. It is a outright reversal of everything that is Western law, innocent till proven guilty, uh, right? I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a flip of everything in your And they faith. have zero actual evidence. They only have four affidavits from local officers, the Capitol Police, who only attest to what happened that day. There's absolutely no evidence against Trump for all of their allegations against him. None. Well, they cite hearsay from the media. That's no, not admissible evidence. No, the, the evidence is going to be his speech. He said, fight like hell, fight like hell. Those are incendiary words. Those are fighting words. And look what happened afterwards. Clearly, it, clearly it incited exactly. It was the spark to the powder keg of the whatever, you know, he had been dousing gasoline on, to use their analogies. But, They'll just say his words. So they don't need his testimony for his own speech. They have that. What they want his testimony for is for things they themselves failed to prove, which was intent, motivation, operation, et cetera. They don't have any of them. And that's because the actual evidence contradicts it. The evidence shows that those people who breached the Capitol did so on their own accord, did so planning prior to Trump's speech, 
did so while Trump was still speaking, did so before Trump used the quote unquote fighting words. Even the reference to the word fight happened after they had already breached the Capitol. Last but not least, many of the people that were arrested have later admitted many of them, some of them were anti-Trump, some of them were anti-government, some of them were boogaloo boys, some of them were uh, anarchistic supporters. Some of They had a wide range of political beliefs, only some of which were Trumpish in origin and none of which could be blamed on uh, Trump. I mean, the so and the law there and incitement is clear and there's been plenty of precedents on it for incitement. You have to have the reason why it's a First Amendment violation and the reason why Raskin had to argue. Raskin couldn't meaningfully argue that the speech was unprotected by the First Amendment. Didn't he? He tried, but it was a very weak argument. That's why he and he couldn't argue that his wanting to use the Fifth Amendment against Trump uh, was not doing exactly what he was doing. Uh, that his attempts to circumvent other protections of the Constitution, including due process, weren't present. That's why he made the extraordinary statement that the precedent they want to set with this impeachment trial is not about Trump, really. It's that there is no constitutional limitation on Congress's power to be judge, jury, and executioner if you've ever held federal office, period. In fact, they want to go a step further. They're arguing under the 14th Amendment, Article Subsection 3, that you don't even need to be an ex-official. They can start holding trials of private citizens anywhere in the country to prohibit people from running for office ever. This is the scary parallel. It's why I tell my liberal friends that the, it, it, uh, the reason why anybody on the constitutional side can no longer in good faith stay on the left is because the left has decided to burn the Constitution. They no longer care about it. it it's an inconvenience. It's an intrusion. It's an obstacle. And, there, and this is one more example of their willingness to make a mockery of it uh, in just going after their political adversaries to establish a precedent to go after a lot of other people. And, you know, it's I've, I asked the question to Dershowitz. I understand Dershowitz's response as to why he still considers himself to be part of the left. I want to ask Jonathan Turley. I want to ask Turley and Noah Feldman. Uh, Pamela, Pamela Carlin, I'll know, I know what her answer is going to be, but I'd like to ask him is like, how can you, how, at what point do you say like, yeah, the, 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 the views that they are espousing and promoting and trying to turn into not law, but turn into trial are contrary to the constitution. And they seem to be, if not emblematic at the very least status quo of the politicians who are themselves on the left. Now, at what point does someone like Jonathan Turley have to say, I, I may not be right, but I'm certainly not left. Like I, I, I would love to know his rationale as to how he still says I'm a Democrat when this is what the arguments they're raising, which he thinks are totally unconstitutional. And it's just one after the other. And it's not even the end of it because there's two other problems with this particular impeachment, which is one, they violated their own rules, which requires that there be separate articles of impeachment for each particular item. Yeah, the reason yeah, for yeah. And the so reason for that is you need to know what you're voting on. In order for two people to convict, you need to know which count they're voting on. Well, they stuck all the counts together within one count. And, and within the uh, criminal world, they try to do this. It's unconstitutional. They call it a multiplicitous or duplicitous uh, or duplicative indictment, uh, but particularly multiplicity, uh, which is basically where they have multiple counts within one count where a jury could vote for guilty, but there not actually be agreement as to which count they're voting guilty on because they've all been shoved into one count. So and that's a that's a problem, including a constitutional problem, which, again, the Democrats answer is let's just scratch the Constitution as it applies to impeachment. And then, uh, of course, the same problem we discussed extensively in the last impeachment debate, which is there is no allegation of a specific crime being committed. Um, and I, I should go to another component, but the, uh, the, and that's because of course there is no criminal law being violated here, but impeachment does need to be a crime. Uh, it, that goes all the way back. That's why it says you can only be impeached for treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. It doesn't say impeached for anything Congress wants to impeach you for. In fact, they explicitly rejected the maladministration language that some had requested. And then last but not least is if you try to, uh, bootstrap the D.C. incitement statute on it, it's clear none of Trump's conduct comes close to meeting the elements for it. That's why they didn't even try to claim it, because they knew they couldn't. Uh, so the this is a case where Trump made a speech asking for peaceful and uh, 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 patriotic protest, which people, even before he was speaking, had already planned to and did breach the Capitol for the purposes of a uh, riot, for the most part, as what's been documented and demonstrated so far, some of whom were not even on 
pro or not even pro Trump, as has been admitted, acknowledged, um, and none of which had anything to do with Trump's speech, nor for which Trump could be held responsible. If we're as Rand Paul was pointing out, if we're going to start holding people responsible, then uh, who does he get to expel for Congress for him getting assaulted because his neighbor was motivated by anti Rand Paul speech? Who does he get? Who does Steve Scalise get to get expelled from Congress because he was shot and almost killed thanks to speech by Rachel Maddow, thanks to speech by Bernie Sanders? They, I mean, if we're going to talk about fighting words being grounds of expulsion, then Nancy Pelosi needs to be expelled tomorrow. Maxine Waters needs to be expelled tomorrow. Omar Talib, uh, Omar and Talib need to be, and AOC all need to be expelled tomorrow. So the uh, now I'm not for that remedy because the point is you don't hold a speaker responsible for the conduct of their audience unless they have imminent unlawful incitement. That's the constitutional standard under the First Amendment. You have to say something that could imminently cause violence, that you want it to cause violence, that it's likely to cause vi cause violence, and that you explicitly call for something that's unlawful in the first place. Otherwise, we get into a very dangerous territory where all of a sudden a, a whole bunch of speech is no longer constitutionally protected speech. And, and just to flesh out the uh, multiplicity of charges in the in the articles of impeachment, the, one of the arguments, which I didn't flesh out well enough in my video, is that they lumped everything together. So there's no there is no individualizing of the actual charges, which raises the problem of what you said. It's, it's like a hodgepodge of accusations that you did this and this and this. You gave a speech which led to an insurrection and or it led to violent protests without just breaking the charges down one by one. You gave a speech. They need to be in separate counts because they knew they didn't have one. And what's amazing, one of the things they say was wrongful was holding a mediation settlement conference uh, with the Georgia Secretary of State. They've con they continue to decontextualize all of these. They, I mean, it reads like an old Soviet style indictment. I mean, it's a, the, in the willingness to just gaslight people about what happened, exclude relevant context, include impertinent information. It's stuff they never do in a criminal case because it gets struck out or beat down because it's uh, Ill illicit, unconstitutional, even by today's uh, standards of politicized cases where they go wayward and rogue quite frequently and quite often. Um, so it's a, 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 for example, Doing, having the mediation conference with the Georgia Secretary of State, where he laid out what his position was, where he believed he would find more votes that were unlawfully cast uh, than was the margin of victory, was precisely his position in the litigation. And they're like, it, they've tried to pretend that he just called the Georgia Secretary of State out of the blue and was demanding a whole bunch. No, it wasn't. This was a settlement conference as part of a pending court proceeding involving a lawsuit between the Trump campaign and the Georgia Secretary of State's office that the Georgia Secretary of State illicitly and illegally breached the confidentiality of by tape recording and leaking. Uh, and then they mischaracterized what he said in that speech anyway. And none of, again, none of that could have constituted illicit speech. I mean, the things they want to criminalize and weaponize and punish, they want to punish First Amendment rights, punish Second Amendment rights, punish Fourth Amendment rights, punish Fifth Amendment rights, punish Sixth Amendment rights. Uh, I mean, will there be a constitution when the Democrats are done with it? That's why if you're a constitutionalist in America, you can no longer be aligned with the Democratic Party. They kicked you out. And I just love what Cleopatra just said. I'm actually happy to see Robert so animated. This is unprecedented and factually unbelievable. You're, you're, there's a number, a number of comments to the effect that you're on fire right now. And it's, I mean, we're going to see what's going to happen. But Robert, what's your prediction? I mean, it, it, any chance they, in a snowball's chance of summer that this passes, that, that he gets convicted? Uh, they don't have the votes. So there's, I said there's a 5% chance because you can never underestimate the idiocy and competence and corruptibility of the current United States Senate. So the given that caveat, once there were 45 votes to say they didn't have jurisdiction, how are a bunch of those 45 votes going to turn around and say, oh, you know what? We really do have jurisdiction and we should vote to convict. So but you, you can't excuse it as an entirely as a possibility. But as they note in the proceedings, they note if there's any precedent set here, uh, then it will be reciprocated in time. Uh, number one and number two, they make the point that the, the president doesn't care what they do because he's not going to consider it legally binding. And if he's going to run, he's going to run anyway. And he's like, good luck getting me kicked off in the ballot in the future. We'll see how that works. Uh, so he's made clear he's unaffected by this. Now, I think I was not impressed by the memorandum, the Trump memorandum. I thought it could have been more effective rhetorically. I thought it could have been more effective substantively. I, they did a good job of going into the weeds on some of the constitutional issues, finding the state court precedents, finding analogous language, looking at the scholastic research. 
It just wasn't written with the verve that I would have preferred. One of the lawyers involved is one of the lawyers that was on the opposite side in the election cases in Pennsylvania. So I, I don't know why that person was brought in. Um, and I think the while he, they opened the door to show his good faith on the election issue. So to me, especially after the Time article, include that as an exhibit and ex include all of it as an exhibit. Just for the record, preserve that for posterity. They have decided not to so so far. And I think that is a, a missed opportunity. Well, so can I think you, those aspects I was disappointed in. Could I love this? Well, this this chat is interesting. Just talks about framing. They weren't participating in a I word. They were attempting to fortify the Democrat. It, it's people power versus it's all fortification now, folks. It's all no, fortification. It's like, it, when when one act is either people power if you like it or insurrection if you don't. I mean that's 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 the world. But uh, judicial knowledge or judicial notice. Can we rely on? Uh, I don't know who's in the Senate now that would do this. Can the Senate Republicans just file that as an exhibit and say we need to take? Note of it by judicial notice, meaning for those oh, who yeah. don't know what that means. And, and, and somebody smart will. We'll see if someone smart takes up the mantle. So okay. the, I mean, Paul Rand Paul kind of has here, but like if Holly wants any future, if Cruz wants any future, so the, another opportunity for them to take up the mind with the Trump side, but be a side uh, on on the Constitution side. I mean that the reason why Dershowitz are going nuts, both were Democrats, both of whom are on the left, is because they recognize. This for constitutional purposes. He kind of went nuts about when people on the right were calling for insurrection act invocation martial law. It was an extremely dangerous happen. And uh, give yourself a power what the other side to have. Uh, they realize wisely how perilous this is to the ability of a constitutional government to function as a constitutional government moving forward. And the and I and that's why it's critical and and it's the reason why both of them have problems if we're going to bridge into it uh, the the Marjorie Taylor Green uh, punishment that is now being imposed for speech didn't even occur while she was elected for the most part. Okay, now hold on, uh, well, which is its own there? set of problems. Let, let, in fact, I, the only reason I want to pause is to let the stream potentially catch up because you're glitching. Uh, I don't know if, if it's your side or my side, but I think it's yours. Um, but yes, good segue into Marjorie Taylor Green because. Here, I know I have an opinion, but I know that I don't have all the facts. And everyone knows my position on, you know, freedom of speech or protected speech. Threats, I, you know, direct calls to violence, no. And even if I believe that there is protected speech and freedom of speech, if you're an elected official and you're liking certain comments, I would expect certain repercussions, not legal ones, but political ones. So Marjorie Taylor Greene... Uh, Exposes some views, objective, you know, conspiracy theories. I guess most people call them. Th th that doesn't uh, call me uh, too tolerant. I don't care about people believing bizarre things. I don't even care if people believe bizarre things that are offensive to other people. Things that I do, where I draw the line is when they start espousing and promoting beliefs that, you know, issue violence, threats of violence, targeted harassment, whatever. So some of the stuff that Marjorie, some of the accusations against Marjorie Taylor Greene, I couldn't care less about. 